Does anyone know what that is? Apart from a great way to send the co-worker death if they're wearing earphones. <laughs> that, that is my plan by putting in the death. <laughs> that's, a, that's a jet engine test. So um, you see this kind of test being run to make sure things work as planned. They cost millions and millions of dollars to run each test. There's hundreds of sensors sitting there. And we're talking about months of preparation between each, each test. To get an idea of the magnitude of some of these tests that we look at for things like jet engine testing or rocket launches or a range of things, you can go and look at what SpaceX do, for example, and the amount of failures they've had too, which are even more expensive than the successes. Now, we're here today to talk about some HPC visualization, other workloads that we're doing in Azure. And when it comes down to it, and you're looking at the options of what you can do, the ability to go and run a jet engine test or a rocket test or other kinds of simulations physically, create the harnesses, have all this time to set up, configure, and also the inherent danger of having something red hot inside a room with people nearby uh, versus simulating it through a HPC cluster and having hundreds or thousands of actual run-throughs of similar scenarios and a whole range of things you could never physically do. And we look at things like car crash simulations too, and you say, well, a car is probably only costing, you know, maybe a $5,000, $6,000 to get that test going for, for the manufacturer. But in actual fact, it's four dollars $500,000 they're looking at spending per test, again, the preparation and the sensors and the data they take in. And if we're doing just physical testing, there's only a limited range of simulations they're going to test just to make sure they're validated and certified. When you go on the HPC side of things, you can suddenly start to run hundreds of thousands of scenarios and run them very, very quickly in a matter of weeks. And, um, and, and go through this to make sure we're actually implementing much, much safer technology in the cars. And, and this goes across a range of products as well. So has anyone ever worked with HPC before? Two people? Doubtful. Maybe one. <laughs> if you do, I'll, I'll come and watch. It'll be great. <laughs> um, well, who knows what HPC is? Sure. <laughs> Excellent. You're on mute, by the way. I can yell. You don't get recorded. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, and, and it's sort of, a, it's a really interesting space we're working in here. I mean, HPC is doing more than just simulations. I mean, these are different Monte Carlo simulations. We're looking at different scenarios. We can do tightly coupled scenarios where we're running things which are dependent on job after job. Stand away from me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and job after job. And we can also look at a lot of the things we're doing around visualization and then also deep learning. So some of the questions you look at it, what would you do with 100 times the scale, the ability to go up quickly to maybe from 100 cores of CPU power to 1,000 cores to 100,000 cores of CPU? What would you do with that ability? There's a whole range of things that we can do. And Felipe can even talk some examples as we go if you want. But the ability to go and look at mapping out human genomes and look at what we can actually get out of people to have service more users to burst up to the cloud and run jobs in minutes instead of weeks or months, which it can take. It really, really sort of enhances the ability of what we can do. One of the, some one of the customers we've spoken to, for example, have HPC running on premises and they use it quite extensively. However, anytime there's a, a major event, all those resources get dedicated to that event and they can't go and do other research, which is still important in its own way, it's just not an emergency at the time. So there's a huge range of things you can do as we sort of go look and see what we can do by having this big compute suddenly available to us at the quick flick of a switch. And, go back a little bit. Sorry. Something important that I think that second point about remove current limitations, I talk to a lot of researchers, and uh, well, traditionally we talk to the IT department, but when you talk to researchers, you realize that for the most part, well, I would say modelers in general, could be analysts, could be anything, that they limit what they're doing <laughs> to the size to the size of the resources that they have, the number of cores, and the time of those resources, right? And we're talking to this uh, climate scientist who wanted to do 150 years of climate change in, Queen, uh, in Queensland, right? And he goes from 50 kilometer grid, given by NOAA, he wanted to go to 12 kilometer grid for higher resolution, basically. And he wanted to add, of course, uh, water temperatures and all that stuff. And when I'm talking to him, I said, so uh, how long is this gonna run for? Three months, and I go, mm, okay. Do you really want to go to 12 or did you want to do something else? Oh, I actually wanted to go to five. Why are you going to 12? Because I'm not gonna get six months of a cluster. Say, okay, what if I give you six months of a cluster with many more, so you can finish actually in three months? And they're like, oh my God, absolutely, let's do it. That's what I need. The higher resolution this data is generated at, the modeling that comes from it, which is uh, bushfires and all that stuff, is much more accurate. 
And that happens in every field. We talk to them and we realize, wow, they're limited what they do, molecular dynamics, genomics. It's always, you know, limited to, and if you think about it, institutions, especially academic institutions, the money comes from those research papers and the grants that come from them. So, the, you know, the institution is suffering in a way for, for that lack of resources that the physical world of a data center <coughs> kind of creates, right? And then when you come with something like that and say, uh, there's Towers Watson, the R&D department is here in Australia, in Sydney, and they come to us and say, why don't we do something crazy? Let's do, let's calculate the cost of insuring the whole population of the planet with $100,000 life insurance and see how much, you know, the risk and everything else is. And we run over 150,000 calls just to see if it's possible, right? So these things start happening when we talk to our customers about the scale and, and the ability to do it in different regions and use different types of hardware become a reality. So that's kind of my thing. I'm really, really passionate about that second point. Just, just a little. Carry on. No, of course, of course. <laughs> and it is, and Felipe has pulled, no, no, hit the nail on the head too. It is really, really cool. So what we can do, the what if scenario is really, really important too. And I'm seeing this in, I've seen it similar in, in medical research where they're going, hey, we've got you know, thousands of samples. We're gonna run around children with cancer and how we sort of cure this. Um, it's like, great, how long does it take you to do the, the sample, to run this sample? And then they go, well, it takes about three, four days per sample. And if you look at that and talk about two, 3,000 samples, it's gonna take years and years to actually run through all those samples, which is a pretty big sample size. And the, and the ability for them to go and run stuff up and have a, a result back on each sample in an hour or two, it's huge and paralyzed and, and actually do it at that kind of scale. Yeah, yeah. So quick little thing about us. We've got uh, Felipe over here. Felipe is Ecuadorian or Mexican or something. Uh, <laughs> Everybody's side of the board is Mexican. I don't know, he doesn't like Trump, that's all we know. Um, <laughs> Felipe is in Wellington, uh, he, via Redmond, and he, he actually went over to Wellington to, to manage a lot of the acquisition of a company we acquired called Green Button, who are doing a lot of the automation and, and batch computing work that you'll see in Azure, and we'll show you later on today. He also has a deep, deep love for deep fried Twinkies, we found out we're in Salt Lake City, um, and they're kind of scary. <laughs> My name's Ben DeQual, I'm based over in Redmond, which you can tell by the accent. <laughs> and I'm a worldwide technical lead for our cloud infrastructure pillar. Um, I don't even ask about that third point. Thanks, Felipe. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so we'd love to sort of get you involved with some questions at the end. It's a very sort of new field, and we're seeing a lot of things going on around what we're doing in the cloud around big compute. So do you know what HPC and Azure actually is? Has anyone looked at what we class as HPC or big compute in the cloud? One person at the back. <laughs> One person. Two, sort of. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Well, you, good you're here then. It's good. You don't, nothing? The guy on, this, on Twitter? It doesn't count. Um, <laughs> it's, look, when we look at the mission we had, and it's like what Felipe was saying too, we radically want to make a difference by providing these compute resources and, and the ability to go out and find that information that we could never dream of getting before by, by, by giving people that ability to scale up to hundreds and thousands of times of what they can do today. The whole mission statement is to enable people to give them more, to get more out of it, and start to discover all these scenarios. I could read it off the page, but it's a little bit more boring. But all these things we can dream about, and that's what we mean when we talk about a lot of our big compute, our visualization, our deep learning. It's finding out the next thing that we didn't know and going from there to somewhere else. It's discovering the what ifs, and, and then searching on those as well. Things we couldn't do easily, because it would take hundreds of thousands or millions of different scenarios to we find sort of things that jump out at you. And, and see and are visible, visible there. So it's a really cool kind of area to be in and things we're doing around this to, to enable people. And a lot of the things you see in big compute aren't things you're gonna need every minute of every day, like maybe production enterprise systems. These are sometimes things where you wait till maybe the end of a month or end of a week or when you've got samples that you wanna run, so the ability to burst that up, it's pretty cool to have that out there. So what's HPC all about? So when we talk about HPC in a standard, high performance computing scenario. We're talking about a huge series of different individual tasks. They could be multiple samples. And we can then break all those samples out and we can assign them across to many computers. Here we've got a representation of four, but think about companies we're talking to. We want to run up maybe a million. Uh, as one company, we want to do a million, I think, for 15 minutes a week. Yeah. And it's crazy, crazy scale. But then assign these different tasks to the computers. They could be tightly or loosely coupled, tightly coupled tasks well, where we have dependencies on the previous task running before we can run the next task. And we're looking at really, really fast connectivity, low latency, high throughput like InfiniBand connectivity, RDMA, custom drivers, and loosely coupled when we start looking at sim simulations and a lot of the testing and models we do. 
And then we're reading the data, and it's computed, and it's written out, and we can start to analyze that information and output. So the way I like to explain this is, it sounds very esoteric, right, HTTP? But it's pretty straightforward when you look at it that way, right? It's data in, it's turned, computed, data out. That's, that's all it does. It's just that it's way faster to split it, or maybe you need to split it for some reason, and do it across many computers, or in this case, many VMs. And of course, the user, because there's quite a bit of users. Yeah, and it's, it, it makes it sound easy when you go, hey, we're just running lots of stuff at once instead of one after another yeah. after another. And it's being used across a range of different things. So we talk about life sciences. Felipe loves working on research in life sciences where we're looking at genome mapping, where we're trying to cure diseases, we're trying to go and do other kinds of really cool research. I mean, there's, a, there's a part which isn't so you know, noble, like you know, oil and gas exploration, mining and other things like that. There was a university we saw in, in Europe who were using it to actually do earthquake simulations to look at how the effects of an earthquake would happen depending on the magnitude and how they could actually evacuate hundreds of thousands of people to actually save lives. There's some really, really cool things going out there and it keeps growing all the time. We're seeing more and more different scenarios come up as people and researchers go and find out what they can do and how they can run things based on their clusters. So one of the things that's really interesting in this demo and uh, this is a, a quick recording because we can't get the visualizations quite through for this. This is a tornado simulation. To actually make this simulation, we're using GPUs in the machine in Azure. The actual data required to simulate, this is well over a terabyte of information and capacity that we've had in, in samples and, and details that come here. We map it down into the geography as well. We can put different geography maps. We can look at a whole range of different scenarios, how it fits together to better understand what the different kinds of cyclones, for example, may mean, the different magnitudes. I mean, does anyone remember the movie Twister? It's probably a little bit quicker than driving around in the truck for two weeks, but wouldn't be a really good movie going, let me just put the sample in. We're done. <laughs> That'd be a damn quick movie. But <laughs> when you look at the scenarios and things you can see out of that, it is really, really amazing to go, we can take this data, run it against different scenarios, make a cyclone bigger, smaller, talk about weather temperature, air moisture, geography, how it's going to work, where it's going to probably move to next, and truly understand how a storm cell like this may move, work. And it's really important to be visual too, because if someone said, can you think about this convention center? Do you imagine the architectural plans, the, the measurements, what it's made out of, or do you imagine the actual visual picture of what it is? At the end of the day, we're visual. People are visual. We like to see things to understand them properly. And to go and run this kind of information like this, it takes about Near, it's, it takes a few days that we're doing on standard CPU-based processing. Running in a graphical process processing unit, a GPU, it's near real time as the data gets inputted in, it's getting fed out and created really, really quickly and really, really fast. And this can be applied to things like rendering farms, it can go to a whole range of things. Felipe's got some live demos showing some of our NV series machines in a little while. And there's also other things too, when you talk about GPU and visualization, we start talking about our other class of, of GPUs in Azure and our MC machines. And these are doing things like deep learning image recognition. You talk about driverless cars, the ability to recognize you know, what a pedestrian is, what another car is, a bike. There was a thing in the paper a while back about a guy on a bike, track standing, like balancing on his bike, and the car couldn't work out what the heck he was doing. He thought he was crossing the intersection, didn't know, but the ability to have processing units like that, connecting back in even from a car, self-driving car into the cloud, to do that image recognition if it needs to as well. There's some huge use cases in what we can do here, and we're, we keep finding out more. So traditionally, when we talk about HPC, it's been really interesting. It's very, very custom-built hardware. I actually have a cool one of that, which you took out, thanks. But it's got like kids sitting on the little benches around HPC cluster, custom-built hardware, really, really specialized. Can only do really one thing, and it's really hard actually to get people who understand how to put it together and use it. Um, we still see some of these out here, but they're becoming less and less common. What's actually becoming much more common is commodity style hardware, which we then specialize with really, really fast in the connects, um, custom made BIOSes and drivers to make it run faster. We'll have high performance, low latency networks if we need it, like InfiniBand, some loosely coupled tasks, we're fine with ethernet. You may or may not have fast storage, um, things like Lustre, Gluster, any of the actual even company proprietary storages as well that could sit there to be run there to take in different kinds of inputs. Um, I saw some content a couple of weeks ago about the Batman Lego movie, really want to see it, <laughs> about how they're running a lot of their data there through HPC clusters to do their rendering. And some of these are now starting to include 
again, it's commodity hardware which we get put in there. You can go and buy it off the shelf if you want to, but customized hardware like FPGAs and GPUs. GPUs you might see if you're gaming or doing things like CAD or Revit or design work, as we said, rendering, deep learning, and FPGAs is something which is relatively new out in the market. We, we released a press annou announcement about it in November, October, I think it was, talking about how we're using it in Microsoft to do things like search and analytics within Bing, and to go and do other kinds of research and, and information in, in, for, for our own actual use cases in Microsoft Research. Really, really interesting stuff happening there, and only people are just now starting to work out if they can use it, how they can use this programmable silicon. So when we talk about HPC and Azure, I actually had a guy in my team start working for us a few months ago in Germany. And, and Germans are very, you know, they're very uh, tactic, they're, not, they're, they're quite, how can I say, they're not very forward in the way they say things, they're extremely forward. <laughs> he just comes out and says, how can you do HPC in the cloud? You're running it on hypervisors, it's virtual, it's not physical dedicated hardware. We're talking about scenarios where 0.1% performance really, really matters when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of cores running. How can you do this? And I just went, whoa, whoa. You know, firstly, why did you take the job? <laughs> and he was, he was really good being challenged actually in that way though, because he was actually trying to understand what he's gonna have to talk about to really make people who are researching data have to play for this. How do their grant money, how do their research dollars that they're looking at using for all kinds of use cases, and they see this as a cost to get there, and how do you convince them that actually it is a better scenario to run? I mean, in Azure itself, we have got highly customized, again, commodity hardware, highly customized BIOS drivers to make sure this works really, really well. One of the big things that you see sitting there is actually the connectivity. It's really, really, well, it's not quite easy, having done it myself on premises, but you can go and set up an InfiniBand network and a, and a, and a grid of net, maybe scale-out storage and all the rest of things there. However, to do it well and to tune it, really, really highly tune it, is not that easy. And we do all that inside of Azure itself. We include a lot of the actual grid licensing around that so you can use those solutions. And we have support in there for Windows, for Linux machines, and we provide a lot of the automation and management around this directly through solutions like Azure Batch, which we again will show in a little bit as well, and through a lot of our ISV partners. So we have the likes of I, um, Altair, um, Ansys, D3 View and other solutions out there doing HPC and doing the, the, uh, doing the actual solving process or maybe scheduling process to, to automate and bring these data in and get results back out and we have all these partnerships. And it's, um, it's really, really interesting to see that there was a test which got run, what's the date on this? It was only like released February 9th? February 9th. The fresh off the press. Very, very fresh. We actually just put it in last night over, uh, over a drink. So we'll see how these quotes come out. Um, <laughs> And, and what happened is a, a series of researchers, they've pu published on the Cornell University website, we're gonna have some links to this if you wanna go and delve into the information. They went through and run, ran LINPAC test. LINPAC test is a synthetic test of um, using algebraic equations to test big compute clusters. They run this test and out of this test they go and formulate the top 500 supercomputers in the world and their performance scales, what they can run at. Yeah, when somebody says that, oh, this is, like the Chinese right now have the fastest supercomputer, is, is because they run it's this. Because of this. It's all, it's all run in Fortran, it's pretty cool, it's been around for a long time. And, um, and they ran this, and what they did, they just picked, a, they picked one of the machines off this top 500, they picked number 60, which was a customized, custom-built supercomputer by Edison. It's running at the National Energy Research Commission in the United States, I think it was. Yeah, and it's, it is a proper supercomputer, it's a Cray CX3, yeah. right? Cray Edison supercomputer. And that was number 60 on the list. I don't know why they picked number 60. I didn't read that into it, but I think they just went, let's pick 60. It seems pretty low down. And they ran HPC, so they, run, they ran some HPC clusters in a multitude of different clouds. And they didn't just run like, you know, maybe 32 cores. They suddenly ramped these up as well to see what, as it scales, quite often as it scales, you lose a percentage of performance. It won't stay at that one-to-one -one mapping as you start to scale out to, to many more tightly coupled scenarios for your big computer. <laughs> And we, we ran, and they ran that up to test out what actually happened. And the result was kind of surprising where um, Azure came in as a highest performing cloud. I'm not gonna talk about any of the other ones here today, but you can go and have a look at the result. But not only that, it actually outperformed the dedicated custom made supercomputer. A and the reason it can go and do this outperforming is, is really the custom BIOS and all this network tuning that we're doing. I mentioned FPGA before, we're using that ourselves in our software defined networking stack for Azure. 
So a lot of these smarts around the networking layer and what we're doing there actually make it really, really interesting. So major four cloud ones got tested in there. And it was a, oh, it's all coming up now. Yeah, the National Energy Research. And we saw actually what it actually came out of there. So the reference system, it scaled at 27.17 times the speed from one to 32 nodes. So the higher the number, the better. And we're talking about that maybe 32 nodes, it should be maybe at 32, is 32 to 32 would be a clean mapping, but we're talking about 27 point, was it 28.33? Sorry? 27 was a supercomputer, yeah. And we're running at 28.33. And when you're talking in a world of small percentages where that means a huge amount of money and also time and, and different kinds of research scenarios you can run, and talk about research as having a cluster maybe for three months only having that extra few days of actual research time they can run, they can get a lot more results and information out. And that is really, really cool. For me, um, I've always sat there going, you know, we've, we've, we know we've tested it, we know we've looked at it, but to have a sort of thing like this to quantify that, yeah, you can actually do big compute in Azure, which will run at the scale you expect, is really, really amazing to see how it comes out there. So when we talk about the different building blocks we have in Azure, we talk about the software and services. We have whole range of drivers, OS support, ISV support, you see straight in the cloud. We've got providers in the marketplace, people like UberCloud, Altair, all in the Azure marketplace. You can click on them, provision workloads straight away, and they'll spin up ARM templates and the management layer so you can actually go and test it out really, really quickly. And the hardware itself is the other big part as well. So you need the right kind of hardware that's gonna be actually there. So in Azure itself, um, I'm sure all of you have seen a range of the different virtual machines we have here with more coming out as well soon. I think we're missing L, Felipe. Um, when we talk about our specialized hardware for big compute, it does fall across the NC, which is a NVIDIA K80 GPUs, the NV, which is a visualization, the M60 GPUs, and the H series, which has um, multiple CPUs and infinity band and RDMA connectivity in the top of the machines for that, if you require it. But it also actually comes across even into the A class, because while the A class is your general purpose, um, kick around machine you may use for web servers or domain controllers or some other simple basic tasks. In the top layer there, we also do provide the InfiniBand and RDMA support and giving that microsecond latency. As you start to go up to the H series, we go into the fastest VMs we can see out there today in public cloud. We have the latest, most latest CPUs that actually specialize to run these kind of workloads. Really, really fast throughput for networking. And, and our, our actual interconnects on this as well, the RD, ability to have RDMA, super fast interconnects and connect to very, very fast storage as well. One of the big things to look at when you talk about machines in Azure, the cores we actually allocate out to our customers as well, we talk about a CPU, there is no hyper-threading, it's a dedicated physical CPU core that you're actually getting. So you're not getting like part of a core that looks like, a, a, looks like it's a full core, you get the dedicated core, which matters a huge, a huge amount when we talk about these solutions. And then on the N, ser N series as well, there's two classes, the NC series. The NC series are K80, Tesla K80 GPUs. And, um, and they're doing a lot of the deep learning and different simulations we're running there. And the NV series. The NV series, the M60 workstations. You could be using these for design, rendering, modeling. Um, anyone like gaming? <laughs> these are $15,000 GPUs sitting inside these machines just for the, just for the GPU alone before you even look at the cost of the, the hardware and the networking and the connectivity. And they're, they're, they're actually getting a huge amount of traction. I was speaking to a customer in Germany in late, late November, and we're sitting down talking about their engineers, and, and their engineers are working all over the place, all around Germany. They were talking to me about how hard it is to find a good engineer nowadays, and the good ones don't want to pick up and move to a centralized office so they can have dedicated hardware next to them. They actually want to go and work from where they are now, where they're with their family, and these are the best engineers they can get, and it's actually a competitive advantage to them to actually start looking at these. They're now running a POC on these machines to run their, their AutoCAD, their Revit, um, their D3, uh, what's it, 3D view solutions, which are doing all these graphical design things, putting different layers as they're building out different things like pipelines or buildings, a range of different scenarios, and they're looking at running these as a replacement over the next few months for their 35 engineers that actually need it. And one of the big advantages too, when we talk about running a workstation machine like this is, as I said before, these GPUs, you go and look them up on the web, they're extremely expensive just for a GPU. And you have to have a, a fair bit of resources there. You put them under your desk, it's gonna be really fun in terms of noise. And, um, and the ability to go and have these, run them up, 
use them, maybe for 35, 40 hours a week when you actually need them to be used, and then turn them off when you don't need them to be used automatically and have all this automation sit in there. That's a really, really powerful thing to be able to say. We can just spin up and provision for 20 more engineers for a big project. We can do that in 10 minutes. Give them access, have them working away for the next two, three weeks, only when they're using it, and we turn them off when we're finished. We're paying by the minute for these machines to be used. And one of the other main reasons we've added that MV series is that uh, traditional HPC workloads, many of them end up with a visualization like Dan was talking about. Mm -hmm. And in the cloud, if you don't have something like this, you end up with you know, an input file that's a few megabytes, but you end up with an output file that could be several gigabytes, and then you need to download it to basically analyze it, understand it on premises. By providing these, you can have the complete workload on the cloud, right, end yeah. to end. Yeah, and you can see a list, and these are the different N-series machines we have up here again, too. So you can see it, you can see all the different connectivity options. We were talking about things like NV, the visualization, N60 GPUs. Um, these are all sitting on, these, are, these have all their cores available, remote visualization, single sort of step things. We've seen people using them, and I'm not sure if you're gonna show it today, to do simulations of, um, of for support as well. So they can go and look at exactly how a drill has been actually built and configured so they can do troubleshooting, look at the physical machine and take it apart. And then we go to the NC series and these are the, and these are the deep learning GPUs, the, the K80 GPUs. And when you start talking about tightly coupled solutions, we have the full RDMA and PD band connectivity options in there so you can go and run these really, really tightly coupled models and look at all this information and data. So we're gonna flick over now to Felipe doing a demo on the actual NV series, depending on internet, I'm gonna give you the, uh, the slide yeah. clicker. Yeah, it's I think, number I five, think, right? I think you had some stuff on the slide first, Dan. Do I? You do. I this first time. I don't think I have anything on this slide. I don't. I'm not sure. That was upside down. You did. There it is, you did. No, I did not. <laughs> so. This. I'm gonna go into that later. Oh, okay. <laughs> can, you, can you please stop touching the button? We've been through this before. No pressure. No pressure, man. Come on. It's like having my five-year-old here. Um, okay, where was it? <laughs> so what I'm doing is connecting from this five-year-old laptop to a 24-core, four-GPU machine in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so... Wow, I got the password right. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And I'm just using RDP, by the way. There are pretty nifty solutions out there to do this uh, remote visualization a bit more uh, effectively. Teradici, Citrix, and others provide it. This is raw RDP going through that network in here, that convention center. So I'm gonna look over here, because I'm pretty bad at pointing and looking elsewhere. Um, so let me see. Uh, before anything else, device manager. Okay, so as you can see there, you see the four, these are the M60s, right? Those are the remote visualization, the four are there. And uh, which one do we do first? Let's do this one first. So remember I was telling you about the complete workload on the cloud. So it's very common for uh, crash test simulation, for example, so computational fluid dynamics to, to end up with something visual that you need to work with to analyze a result. In this case, this is a software from uh, LSTC. It's called LS Prepost. This is this, uh, they're basically their general visualization tool, right? And what I have here is what uh, it's created by their uh, software called LS Dyno. It's a crash test uh, uh, solver. And I, I, we showed it kind of at the beginning, but as you can see, I'm interacting with this as if it were on my desktop. I'm rotating it, and then I'm just playing to analyze the results, right? And what I like about it, so even though there's a little bit of lag there because you know, it's, I'm just using raw RDP, what's important here is the ability to interact with this model and not get those quirky things where you do something, nothing happens, you do it again and you get twice what you asked for, right? So as you can see, it runs very smoothly, you can see it nicely. Um, the other thing I'm gonna show you is, I didn't know this existed until <laughs> I saw the other day, these clever folks at Tetra 4D somehow embed 3D models in regular PDFs. This is Acrobat Reader. 
But just imagine you're sharing your model, your research, whatever you're doing, like you do with a PDF in a way that it can be visualized but not copied or whatever it is that you wanna block in the PDF. And you can interact with this 3D model very, very cleanly. As you can see again, very responsive. I can rotate it. Let me zoom over here, it's nicer. And th this is in Singapore too, so we're connecting over a high latency network here. It's over saturated obviously too. And connecting into this machine to get this workstation running and visualizing this. Zoom in some more, Felipe. Yeah, no, it, it feels great. <laughs> and then, this one I love. Um, this is VMDs, it's for uh, molecular dynamics. I don't know if there are any bioinformaticians here, but this is an extremely complex model uh, from VMD. VMD is the visualization tool for <laughs> several applications, but NAMD is the typical one for molecular dynamics. And as you can see, very responsive. Um, I would never get 56 frames per second on my laptop, right? I think I tested and it was like in the 14, 15. So I'm getting all 56 and then I, of course, can interact with the model. But now, the, what is it? The French call it the piece de resistance. Because we're working with NVIDIA, I got a hold of one of their demos and this is actually rendering in real life, right? It's not a model that an application is running for me. This is going to render something in, in real life on the GPUs, which is something you can do for all type of models. And this is actually from a research, um, that you're gonna see who was doing the research. When it loads, it's coming. Wait for it. There you go. So uh, it's basically a human gesture research, I guess. I'm obviously manipulating him. I'm doing sideways scans. I can zoom into the skin. I really like this part. I can put him in different lighting. I can control his gestures. This one's pretty interesting. <laughs> and let me get one that actually has his eyes open. Oh, that's, that's friendlier. And I can change his eye color. Yeah, so it's pretty cool and it's very, very responsive as you can see, right? So um, just imagine, and you can do this from an iPad, you can do from an Android tablet. It really does change the conversation. I love this because um, we talk to many scientists and they say, you know, I, I do have a powerful workstation, but I, I kind of need to wait for when either, <coughs> uh, you know, finishes doing because I only have one workstation or if I know it's gonna finish over the weekend, I need to go to the office to restart the next, you know, three, four days of modeling. Well, you don't have to anymore. And on top of that, you don't have one workstation, you can have three, four, five, six workstations, right? Because that's a typical thing. You get one workstation and only one, right? But when I was talking to a molecular dynamics guy in Melbourne, and he runs for two weeks at a time, very complex model, amazing machine, 32 cores and a GPU. But he's locked out of that machine for two weeks at a time, every time he clicks go, right? So it, it, when I tell him, you know, I can give you two or three of these, he'll go, oh yes. So that is that. And now back to number six, is it? Number six. Okay, now I'm gonna talk to the slides. <coughs> so he talked about the hardware. Let me tell you about the software, right? Because as you know, in the cloud, you have a combination of the hardware infrastructure, then you have certain services to access that hardware. We're building beyond that because we, <laughs> I mean, we will give you infrastructure as a service, but we believe that it's much better if we give infrastructure as a service and an easy way to deploy and manage so you can actually spend your time uh, configuring what you want to run. So I've tried to come up with a clear way to, I guess, represent the different options that I think are more, um, that, that would make more sense to our customer, let's put it that way. So uh, the way we divided it is the first step the obvious step is when you already have on-premises infrastructure is to burst to the cloud. That means adding capacity on demand on the cloud. You continue to have your on-premises infrastructure. It could be a cluster running any scheduler <coughs> and only when you want to burst to the cloud, you add that. We actually have a lot of customers doing this, particularly financial uh, services institutions that uh, because of regulation, they need to show the regulators they still have a cluster on-premises, but they run 5,000, 6,000 cores every day of the week for three, four hours after the market closes. We do have um, a software product called Microsoft HPC Pack that was created in Windows Server. That's really where that story of Microsoft in HPC comes from. 12 years ago, it was a Windows Server technology to run HPC workloads on, on 
a Windows server. What we did, my team did, is we added to HPC Pack the, the, the ability to burst to the cloud tremendously easily. It's just literally configuring a little template, which is the same kind of template used for on-premises. You give the information that we need, you know, subscription ID, where you want to deploy this, that kind of stuff, and we take care of everything as you can schedule when the nodes come up, when they come down, you could decide the size of the node. It's a very, very clean way of doing it. And it's not just Windows too. We talk about Windows, but we're running Linux as well. It's got full support for all the all the different distros you see yeah, out there. Yeah, good point. And both um, the premises it's are gonna be cool because we say Windows HPC pack, but it's not just Windows. It's running a whole range. That's why I call it Microsoft HPC pack. You changed it. Yeah. I like it. Um, <laughs> but that, that's really cool. Again, again, in the in the big compute kind of world, in the HPC world, we're probably looking at 90% or more of these workloads running on Linux, so it's really, yeah, really important to do this. Yeah. I was being nice. Yeah. <laughs> hopeful. <laughs> hopeful. Being hopeful. But still, we, you know, we've seen the stickers. We love Linux. It's good. Yeah, yeah. So the next obvious step is, and uh, we tend to call this all on the cloud or infrastructure as a service, is to deploy the whole cluster in the cloud. But to be honest, the more I talk to customers, that's another hybrid scenario. Why? Because you could do the same if you were to continue having on-premises infrastructure. The way this works is you kind of mimic the on-premises environment on the cloud, same scheduler, same distro of Linux or version of Windows, and then the applications. And this provides this easy lift and shift scenario where you go, okay, I'm using PBS Pro with these scripts to submit to PBS Pro and these applications, let's just mimic it on the cloud. And a whole new interesting range of uh, solutions for those who need them start happening where because you're not sharing a cluster, when I talk to folks that are doing HPC for a long time, they're like, okay, so I can put a cluster up there and I can give it to these two or three departments. Like, why would you? Just give a separate cluster to each department. Just give them what they need. If one department might need GPUs, the other one might not. One might need the Infinity Band RDMA, the other one might not. But hey, do a cluster per user. And we had, we had one customer doing this actually as a burst scenario using, you mentioned PBS yeah. Pro out there. They're bursting the cloud too using that scenario too, it's one of our software partners. Yeah, no, and we actually have a big insurance company in the US that where uses of Microsoft HPC Pack, they have two co-locations, right? They have uh, 16 separate clusters in one and in the other. The first step for them was to burst. The next step is now to have the third co-location is now a cluster completely on the cloud, right? That they're using for disaster recovery, but I know them every time they say, so one of the co-locations was for disaster recovery, but it's running production workloads, right? Because when we first met them, they have like four clusters in each, and they're like five, six, seven. They keep adding because they keep running <laughs> more stuff. So we're like, okay. But where the future is, especially for the developers out there, is in this guy. Oh, that's not shown. There it is. Yeah, yeah. Who knows why that is animated? Um, Azure Batch. Azure Batch is difficult to explain and a bit complicated to understand. So the idea behind Azure Batch is we wanted to take it to the next step, right? Whatever you do when you're doing HPC, there's always hardware or infrastructure if it's a cloud. There's something that needs to be managed that would orchestrate the jobs and the compute nodes that need to be configured. Batch tries to abstract all of that. I'm gonna give you more detail about it. The idea behind Batch is that you can focus on the uh, workload, we do the plumbing, the infrastructure, and the scheduling. And I, sh I even have a demo to show you that. that. That's really important. I mean, you go and talk to a researcher, they don't want to be there managing hardware. In fact, we don't really want to be managing hardware or, or updates or patching. For them, they just want to run samples and code. And I would argue, because I talk to IT departments all the time, and they tell me, and I tell them, your job is not to manage a class. And well, is it? No, no, no. Your job is to provide the resources for your end user to do their job, right? You're managing the cluster because you have to. It's that headache in the middle. It, with batch or with the cloud in general, you can provide the same resources because that knowledge is required, right? But you don't have to worry about the hardware. Uh, we take care of it. Uh, we even do the refresh cycles for you, right? We get a newer processor, we get a faster InfiniBand, first QDR, then FD, FDR, now we're looking at EDR. We do everything for you. And some people are using it even for things like uh, Hadoop clusters to build out Hadoop clusters and provision them up and down as well. Yeah. Don't know who that would be. <laughs> <laughs> so another way to think about it when we look, kind of take a step back and look at the three scenarios is the first two, the hybrid, the burst, whatever you want to call it, and the one that's all on the cloud is self-managed. Right? You're in charge. We, we help you do this literally with a couple of clicks, right? Or a script that you can actually put on some kind of schedule. But after that, there's some management involved. With Azure Batch, it's completely fully managed. We take care of that, you just concentrate on the application. Why did we do it? Well, we put some codes there, but it's going back to 
This what? is why Felipe moved to New Zealand for Azure Batch. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So yeah, the part of the team is, so what's interesting is that we were working on Azure Batch and this uh, startup, this very clever startup in, uh, in New Zealand was building kind of the next generation on top of that, basically the workloads, enabling the workloads, helping with the applications, the file and data movement and all the stuff. We, mm, that's where we wanna <laughs> go in a few years, might as well bring them into the fold and, and I moved to be part of that team. Uh, but it's, it was basically customers telling us, even though we have all these facilities and this easy way to deploy, especially when you're talking to the modelers, the analysts, um, they go, yeah, but I still, I don't wanna do that, right? I just want to run my workload, that's my job. So that's what we aim for with Azure Batch. Um, oh. <laughs> so another way of picturing it is, of course, as a cloud provider, we provide you know, that bottom box, right? I mean, in our case, we also provide platform as a service. I think we're the only cloud that provides platform as a service, but it's basically an app services that let you get to the hardware that we provide, right? And at the top is the application you want to run. If you were to build or even use an existing HPC cluster to run that application on our platform, you need to worry about all that kind of middle tier stuff, right? What is gonna schedule it? What happens when something fails? It could be a task, it could be a VM. How do you build resiliency? When do you grow? When do you scale down? Uh, all that stuff you need to take care of. The idea with Batch is that all that is taken care of by the platform itself, right? You can only worry about the application you know, by leveraging what the platform provides all the way to the tier. And enough talk, let's do a demo. Just, just a quick question. Uh, we have a real client using HPC as a service. Yeah. Do, do you mean for themselves or to sell to other people? Yes, yes. We are using Windows Media Services runs on us. They don't do HPC, but they use it for resource management. Because the, the two key things that Batch give you, especially when you're building a software as a service solution, is resource management and scheduling. So what they do is they use us to deploy the specific VMs that they need for the encoding and schedule one job in that VM with the right codec, with the right application, with the right stuff to run that. And then we have customers, I was telling you about Towers Watson, who started actually naturally, I don't know, makes sense. They, they had HPC pack clusters, they had the, the glue to talk to the HPC pack cluster from their application. So they started with a cluster. And I, I, I laugh because I talk to customers that try to explain batch, especially the traditional ones, and they go, yeah, no, 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 no. You know, let's, let's just do the old HPC pack stuff or PBS Pro, whatever. Invariably, three, six months later, they come kind of question, like, what was that about batch or something that you were talking about? because it, it's a pain to manage the infrastructure. So for folks providing software as a service, it's completely godsend. And on top of that, we're talking to an infrastructure provider, and I shouldn't say, they don't want to say anything yet, but an infrastructure provider is a global, many universities, many research centers, same idea, they want to move to the cloud, some of the workloads, they don't want to do a refresh cycle. We talk to them, we tell them about batch, and they go, well, I don't know, let's just do the old way. Three months later, what was that about batch? <laughs> they got it working, but they're like, oh man, it's still a pain, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, you still need to manage at least something, right? With batch, it's all abstracted for you. And you go, oh, okay. Before we do the demo, Felipe, we're gonna talk about what actually we're doing, what Blast is. Oh, thank you very much for reminding me. This was the one I thought you That's forgot. That's the one you were This one I thought we forgot about. Yeah, we make a good <coughs> team. So we're, we're doing, we're gonna show you a demo of actually running batch on Blast. Did you touch the button? Of course I did, I love pressing your buttons. Uh, <laughs> so doing HPC <laughs> on Blast. Blast using Azure Batch with Blast. Blast is just one of many different models we can run. And it's looking actually at these protein samples and it's mapping it all to a database. We haven't, I think, got the best protein samples because they're too, they're too well known. They map too much. Yeah, well, Blast in essence is, uh, I don't know if there are, again, any bioinformaticians here, but <laughs> think about <laughs> Blast. Oh, everyone. Yeah. yeah, it sounds esoteric, but what it does is it's a search engine. It's a search and comparison engine, right? You have a sequence of any type, could be a protein, could be a genome, and you're comparing it to a database that has already been put together by someone to see what matches, right? And understand then what it is that you're looking at. It could be a sample that you took in the field or something like that. But it's of, of course extremely sophisticated, right? Where there are gaps, it would, you know, it would give you a value of accuracy based on gaps and if there are pieces that didn't match and all this stuff. But the way to think about it is a huge, very, very smart, very, very advanced algorithm for doing this search across a lot of information. Right, and for that reason, it's beautifully parallelizable, right? Because what you do is you have the, what you want to compare and you have what you want to compare against, 
and you just divide it into little pieces and give these to many computers to do it. At and the we're looking time. at hundreds, hundreds of samples. We're looking at hundreds of thousands of samples for this workload as well. And then we go through and visualize <laughs> it afterwards too. So this time for real, <laughs> the demo. <laughs> so what we did is um, try to, in, in our efforts to explain uh, batch to folks, we came up with a quick demo. We actually shown this to many customers. What I'm, we're looking at here, of course, it's through uh, Explorer. I'm just looking at, let me remove the favorites so that there's more. And this is, this is we've built this all up in Azure, just through um, Azure websites, and we've got a little uh, resource group where it's all configured and set up too. So it's just a little visual one. Quite often for researchers, it'll be all command line based too. Yeah, Still. we've done that too, so may I? Thank you. So the idea behind this is to show the interaction between a client and the service, right? This client can be anything. In this case, it's a simple web app. We've done the same for command line interface, right? We were talking to these researchers who do the typical thing. He, he's a, a weather uh, analyst, but he actually had to SSH into the cluster, right? Upload his data, run a little command there, get out, you know, kind of, oh yeah, that takes about three hours, go in, check the folder's still empty, okay. And we told him, no, 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 let's, let, we'll wrap the little executable that you have, and that will talk to Batch, and I will ask for the resources, it will upload the data, it will do everything. You can, if he actually wanted to run different versions of the same application, it's called WRF, maybe you're, you've heard of it, I'm like, okay. And he still was not quite getting it, right? And then when we, when we delivered that, I said, okay, I need to get in the class, he's like, no, you'll run it from your laptop. I'm like, what? Yeah, you just run it from your laptop. I don't need to upload anything. No, just run the command line from the laptop. And, and magic happens in the background, right? So it's the same concept. We have another application, Blender, which is for, uh, for 3D rendering, has this concept of plugins, where we create a plugin for batch. So in the same way that render has the ability, let's say, to submit to a cluster or to render locally on the machine, you just go, okay, uh, you know, 20 nodes, da, da, da. Click send in the background, Blender talks, it's, uh, it's basically Python, it talks to Batch, Batch deploys the, the stuff, runs, and Blender just does you know, basic monitoring and status checking until it's ready and it downloads and it's ready. From the, what's beautiful is from the perspective of the end user, nothing changes, right? They're in the same environment. They don't have to FTP or SSH or RDP into anything. So that's the beauty of it. And that's what we wanted to do with Blast. So in this case is Blast Plus. So I'm gonna start a search. Or I should preface by saying we have two pools. The concept of batch for resources, we call them pools of resources. So I have one that's running all the time, right? It's D14, D2s running 10 instances each. But let me show you a really cool search with what we call an outer pool. So I'm gonna call it Ignite D3. And I'm gonna grab, these are the reference databases that the uh, sequences are gonna be checked against. I'm gonna grab the protein one. And I have a few here, let's just grab 10. Each one of those is imagine a sample taken from the field of something that I want to understand what it is. I'm gonna leave it as blast fill. And this is where I could select that pool that's already pre-configured or I could actually tell blast, you know, uh, uh, tell blast in this case we will tell batch. I want you to deploy a pool only for this job and to shut it off, you know, destroy and for me to stop paying as soon as the job has completed, that's it. Right, so I call it the pool. And those are expensive, so I'm gonna grab the five V2s. <laughs> and we selected 10, so let's run them all in parallel. So how many, how many cores are we provisioning now? Uh, D5, 16, 160 cores. 160 cores. <coughs> I could have done the... <laughs> D14. Yeah, yeah no, they're way too expensive <laughs> for this demo. You should see my monthly bill. Um, anyway, so that's running. Top three accounts in, in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime, so right now magic is happening in the background. And I'll show you. I'll show you step by step what's happening. Well, but so, you huh? You yeah, you, uh, you want me to <laughs> add it to, to your? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know the capacity, guys. So, <laughs> I think this subscription I have 512 cores. It's not bad. Uh, that's small. We've done thousands, right? Um, so while that is running on that, let me run a quick one demo on a static, right? On the static pool. Because you're gonna see how quickly this runs. And I'm gonna run, let's see, from 11 to 20. I was happy that I had 20. And then now, instead of that, because let's say I need the job right away, I select that demo pool. This one's already listed, that's the auto pool. So I'm gonna, the demo pool that's static, I don't need to do anything, and that runs. 
So what's nice about this is that it provides whomever put this together, the ability to show the end-to-end -end and to contain the end-to-end -end workflow for the bioinformatician in this case within the context of the same client, right? And again, this could be a client running here, this could be a web client and as in this case, and it has completed. And what's even more exciting, now that the compute, the HPC part is done, the analysis can be done in the same place. This is an application called Cablamo, it's basically um, Java, JavaScript running on, the, on that portal and it shows you a nice visualization where the alignments are. I won't even pretend to understand what it means, <laughs> but <laughs> believe me, those are the alignments. And the, this was, a, to me, this is the easiest way to see the alignments. It's kind of what I show you, that diagram, it shows you what aligns and where the gaps are and all that stuff. It has this very nice representation to see how that works. So that was on that. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, and also for the demo pool, this is the pool that was already configured, the pools are up and running. If you're looking at, your, your Azure Batch service. Um, you can start to see the cores being provisioned and then start to be worked on as well very, very yeah, quickly. Yeah, correct. We had a fight over this when he went to show the portal, that took forever. So- Don't uh, say bad things about the portal. I don't, did I say bad things? <laughs> so um, <laughs> as you can see, the demo pool, the one I created already has, uh, we have this concept of you know, target versus current, it already has a 10 nodes. That, that doesn't mean they're necessarily running, it just means that Azure has confirmed, yep, I'll give you the 10 nodes, right? Because if I go to searches, and that's something that's within, we need a very nice kind of list of all the previous searches, you can see that Ignite demo, it's running, but it's still waiting to run. So in the meantime, we'll get back, we'll come back. Uh, in the meantime, let me tell you what's happening behind the scenes. And that's six. Anything you want me to say or? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> so, reminds me I'm Albert, I'm a bioinformatician. I just went to my laptop and I'm communicating, right? I'm just sending the job to this portal. It's basic, I think it's a cool core app uh, in, in one of those web instances, right? They're very, very cheap. So I submit my job, all is good. I'm done for now, right? I'm just kind of waiting for my result. I'm gonna show you exactly what the web portal does. It's tremendously simple. This, this kind of happens in a sequence or in parallel because it's talking to a server. So the web portal goes there and says, hey, um, Albert you know, wants a pool, but I want it to be an auto pool. So I want a pool of this size. Like, okay, I'll, you know, that's it. Next thing goes, okay, and by the way, um, I want you in each one of those VMs to have Blast installed and the reference databases. In the context of Batch, Blast is called an application package, it's a zip file. We install it for you, we put it wherever you want it, and then we download as a resource file the databases that are needed for the computation, right? Again, the portal is not doing this, just telling Blast, it's telling Batch, I need you to do all this for me. Next he says, oh, and by the way, I wanna schedule these jobs ahead of time, so when those VMs are ready, and when the databases are there, and when the application is installed, you start these jobs on those pools, right? And from the perspective of the web portal or the, of the client app, because it's really a client app, it's done. You know, everything is on, on the control now by the server. And then obviously, it starts checking status. It says, oh, those have finished. Okay, send me the results, right? Also you need to do is take this 10 seconds, whatever refresh cycle seems reasonable, check the results. And because Batch knows that you already got the results, the job has completed, everything's good, it automatically takes care of the pool and destroys it for you. So that's basically what's happening behind the scenes. And of course, at a certain point, Albert from home, from whatever he is, connects again and says, you know, we're in, is it 100% already? And that's his visualization there. So let me see where this is at. And, th and that web pool is something I, I think one of, our, one of our teams knocked up in what, half a day, a day to get the something actual like web that, pool yeah. together. Yeah. So that's a, it's a pretty simplistic sort of web interface that we've put together there. You can go and build far more complex ones. Um, whatever you need to do, integrate them in. That's just an example of what you can do. All the smarts is actually on the back end in the batch service, not on the actual front end in that web service. And we have a customer that, we just gave him the code. This code is on GitHub, by the way. We have a customer that loved this. He loves the idea of having a, a web client and say, can we use the code? Yeah, yeah, do it. It's for not, run, not, not for running Blast, it's for running something completely different. But it's the basics, you know, the, the, the communicating with uh, batch that he wanted. As you can see, this finished, I can visualize the results. It's kind of that last bit, they have been downloaded, they're in the context of the portal, and if I go to the pool, the pool has disappeared, right? Sometimes if I'm lucky enough, I get there where it says current node count zero, and no, current node count 10, and you know, target node zero, and then you see it when it refreshes changing and poof, disappears. So that's batch behind the scenes. 
So hopefully that explains, because it's tough to explain badge, especially for the traditional HPC folks, but it's this idea of a service on a cloud that does everything or the majority of things for you. Um, that's the underneath thing. The cool thing is that once you build something like that, a service that has the basic resource management capabilities and does the scheduling, you can start building more smarts into it, more tools. So just a couple of things that just came out. Hearing from a lot of customers, especially the IT side of things, I would love to run containers, right? They're excellent tools to run containers, but if I can use containers to basically stage my app, stage my data, and run them at scale, like if we well, look for a parallel job, that would be fantastic. So we came up with what's called Shipyard. It is, again, on GitHub. It's a brave new world, by the way. All, a lot of our stuff goes, it's basically open source. We put it on GitHub, it's for you guys to, to download, to test, to modify, to customize, to contribute to, if you come up with something cool, we have a lot of customers contributing. But the cool thing about that is not just that it's containers, but because we own the technology to get onto the network and all stuff, uh, it actually can access both, being a container, it can access on the host, both the GPU and the Infinity network. So you can run the, the tightly coupled jobs or the GPU jobs run containers. It's quite an achievement, actually. And, and it really, really simplifies, too. I mean, we talk about what we're doing in Git. There's a whole recipe book, is what we're sort of looking at. It's a book of recipes of things you can actually build out and do. I mean, today we've got things like Slurm and a few other things in there. We keep adding to that book of recipes, and hopefully we get more customers and researchers adding to it as well. So instead of just having to go and configure cores or clusters and write all this code, you've got the recipe pre-configured. Just deploy. Yeah, and that's what we want to, to do, exactly. Yeah, that's a good exactly point. Exactly right. It's really, really it's cool. It's a you library of examples. What do I feel like? Yeah, and, and the cool thing about it, by for the me. way, for, for the not, not coding guys like me, I'm an IT guy, is that um, this is all done through a uh, declarative language, through JSON. It's a file, right? I don't know if you're familiar with ARM templates, but it, they're so well received. They'll say, let's do the same thing. So you imagine an ARM template, a JSON file, where you say, okay, this is how I want to run my containers and all that stuff. So it's very easy to use, reuse, configure, and to understand, right? Even config it even includes implementation of the Docker engine as you're going through the process yes. too. So you don't have to go and configure Docker. Everything is built into the, into the JSON file. And then the next step is, let's do it for everything, not just containers, right? So application templates is this idea that we call it internally no code jobs, no code, right? Where with JSON, you can do everything with batch, everything. So one of the things that you can do is do a JSON file, control not just Shipyard, but other things that happen behind the scenes. Now, if you're proficient with Python or Node.js or PowerShell, of course, you're the batch provides all those interfaces for you to interact with it. Right? But we're just trying to make it as easy as possible. And we're beginning to think about, okay, are there certain workloads, types of workloads that we can make even easier because we create, let's say, one of those declarative files specifically for uh, genomic sequencing. Right? So we're beginning to talk to customers about that where it's, it's from, you know, we, we go from infrastructure as a service to HPC as a service to kind of workload as a service, right? Um, you want to talk about the related content? Yeah, yeah and there's, um, there's a bunch of sessions that are Probably most of them probably happened already when you put this together, but things that might be actually interesting to go and have a look at. So things like creating ARM templates, very, very useful when talking about provisioning big compute clusters. We're talking about provisioning machines, scaling out, scaling back down. If you haven't looked at ARM templates, it's a probably a good session to go and sort of get an understanding about how we configure and build these. Uh, there was one of the sessions run by, I think it was, uh, I can't remember who it was, by, on Docker as well, as we talk about things like Batch Shipyard. Docker is being used in more and more places. So good session to understand about how you can actually use Docker on Azure. Another one on Linux on Azure too. Again, 95% or so of our workloads we see for big compute are Linux based. So understand what the requirements are around drivers and distros and there's a lot of work that goes into that. And um, <coughs> Express Route also is another big thing to look at here. If we're talking about visualization, big compute, <coughs> even big data solutions running on Azure, having that really low latency, quick connectivity, big pipe into, the, into Azure really, really helps to sort of get the data and the samples and the information across and back and we've got a few people out there, even network providers and ISV partners who are doing that kind of scaling across on-premises and cloud to make sure as we one, run these big compute clusters and we scale them up and down, they can automatically have the same data set and same outputs in two locations, on-premises and in Azure. And the benchmarking we talked about where we looked at what was actually being run in Azure, 
and the tests that went on against other cloud providers and the, the Edison Cray Edison supercomputer from the National Energy Research Commission. You can go and see the results there. If you want a good bit of reading material before you go to bed, the PDF is great. <laughs> It has, uh, it has some pretty pictures. It has some pretty pictures. It goes into some really good detail, too, about how they run yeah. the tests and what they saw as the different outputs and results. Yeah, it's a proper research paper. Yeah, definitely. And then they told us we need to show this. Yeah, keep <laughs> learning or something. Uh, <laughs> um, I think everything, uh, everything from Ignite's going to be on Channel 9, MSDN.com, and free training and something. Yeah, and then your feedback. Your feedback. Do your feedback. No, <laughs> actually probably don't do your feedback. <laughs> um, and look, I would love to have some questions now. Yes. It's really, really great if we, we had some interaction We made it, we wanted to you. leave 15 minutes for questions. Perfect. So the question is when's N-series, are we talking about NC or NV-series to, to be in the Australian data centers? Right now, I mean, there's, there's a lot of planning going on. Um, so just watch what I say, I don't get myself in trouble. A lot of planning going on around this right now. Uh, NC, I think, is a little bit further away, but NV, we're actually currently in the planning stage. We hope to have some dates available. If you speak, to, uh, if you can go through accounting, because we have to do it under NDA and all this kind of stuff, but some dates available in the near, very near future. Um, today, you have to connect into Singapore. Um, over shared internet at a convention center, we just did that over RDP. If you're using PC over IP or ICA, it's going to be a far better result too, but they're, they're I can't say exact time, <laughs> get shot, but it's in the planning phase to come into at least one of the Australian regions in the near future for NV series. Yeah, and to be honest, it, it, it would be ideal, uh, but actually Australia also has an incredibly good connection to West US. Um, but um, the majority of workloads, when I have this conversation with customers, the majority of workloads tend to be okay running outside of Australia for now. And so it hasn't been a blocker with anyone thus far. But yeah, there are certain types of uh, information you leave. It cannot leave either uh, a region or it cannot leave Australia, and, and that's when you really. But uh, what we're trying also to, and, and it would be great to talk to you, is uh, we're building a pipeline to kind of, I wouldn't call it a business case, but understand the size of the cluster, for example, that we will need to deploy in Australia based on what we know customers are going to need, and that even the decision between <coughs> NV and NC or both of them, right? Yeah, we mean, don't want to deploy blindly and then wonder why people are, you know, we're not in the, let's build it, then they will come <laughs> business yeah. anymore. <laughs> we're, 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 we're exactly doing that, yeah. But we said my team are actually going out and working with customers around the world. And we're, as we talk to them, we're getting the information about what they want to run, where they want to run it, the criticality, all this kind of stuff. That's how we're actually prioritizing the build and configuration of where we deploy these clusters. We could change cluster deployment from being planned in one location to a different based on what we're seeing come back in through the team and the account teams and everything else. Because it take a very, very long time to build and God knows, in the million, many millions of dollars just for one sort of node of one of these clusters that we deploy into Azure. The good news is now we have plenty of space in Australia. So. Yes? So the question was, if we've got any plans for big RAN support. So are we talking about for HPC? We're talking about for SAP, Oracle, well, SQL well, databases? Well, well, we're saying it's in that last paragraph of the question. Yeah. So I need to go back and check the list. We have, I think we've just, we've renamed them from Z or Z for the Americans to N series. And we have these slated to come out. I'm not sure about the Australian dates. We'd have to go back and check through. Um, and we're looking at actually provisioning machines going up to six terabytes of memory inside of Azure. Uh, these will obviously start off there. They're, I think we've got them available in preview right now in the US. And we're probably gonna look at growing them out. Again, based on demand, based on what we're seeing out there. Quite a lot of, and it depends on the workload, a lot of traditional HPC and visualization is based on what we see in the H, NC, and in, in V series. Um, we talk about large memory sets, a lot of that is in memory database applications. Yeah, basically, yeah. But that said, researchers will do whatever they need to do to get their results, and some things are customized in different ways. I wonder, there's a lot of RAM in the world, and yeah. second <laughs> That's why they need that many memory. They need all the memory for the memory <laughs> leaks. Yeah, yeah we can, we, I mean, you can get access to one of those running in the US today, even if you want to test it on the West Coast. And I think we have them in, in South, South Central, I maybe. So. I think it's South Central US. Um, but yeah, again, reach out. We can, we can get all those details across to you as well. Um, uh, M, I think, is what we decided to rename it to. It was initially Z. Uh, I'm on Twitter, too, if you want to sort of ping me on there and ask any other questions. We can set things up. Um, or find me on LinkedIn or anywhere else to speak to your account teams, and we can get some answers for you there again. 
there's a lot of planning going on. I, I can actually, I've got access to all the sheets that Felipe and I were sort of look at with all the teams about where things are being deployed. And a lot of it is just about a planning and approval process to make sure we can get them out. Yeah, we couldn't even shift around things, right? When we think of going in one region and then we get all these. Yeah, uh, it, takes a, it takes a long time to order all the hardware and get it together and make sure it works. But once we've actually got that, it can be deployed almost anywhere um, within reason physical capacity. Excellent. Uh, any other questions around what we looked at here? The, the question was if we do any support for Data Lake in HPC. Um, We're looking into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the traditional HPC workloads that we tend to deal with, even though Data Lake is awesome, it's really intended more for big data. Um, we tend to just do infrastructure as a service and deploy a viral file system on some powerful VMs with SSD drives. Cluster, Lustre, BGFS. Yes, and we get common pretty good traditional, you know, single mount NFS, blah, blah, blah. So we looked into it. We talked to them quite often. We asked for a few things. If they have eventually time to provide it, as we're not their main scenario. But in the meantime, we do really, really well with the normal alternative, mm. mostly because yeah. there's no changes to the app also. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, it's correct. So there's a question about if we consider HD Insights or Hadoop as, as, as HPC, and it's sort of funny, it's sort of sitting in a different group to where Felipe works and our, our sort of our advanced analytics team are looking at those solutions, whether they're first party or through a, an ISV like Cloudera or Hortonworks. Um, there's a lot of conversations and there's a lot of cross teams too. I was working with the Azure storage team two, three weeks, no, two weeks ago. Um, and we we're talking about what we're doing around data lake support. They don't own data lake, they own all the storage backend. So data lake is really just actually a pretty smart layer on top. It's not even doing what you'd see if a tradi traditional HDFS was all the sharding. They're letting the Azure storage do all the sharding across different mm -hmm. physical footprints. And I think we had a question up the back too. So, so the question was, we're seeing interest in companies like Weta, um, I guess other ones like Animal Logic, other companies like that around using these kind of compute clusters and, and seeing if they can use their production workloads, pre-production. Um, yes. Yes? No, actually, yes. What happened is that, it's funny, um, when you talk to a traditional HPC person, they will say, well, well movie render is not HPC. Well, when you talk to what these guys are doing for the rendering, what they did for Avatar, it's, it's HPC. <laughs> it's, it's not just rendering, it's all these filters and, yeah, so we've talked to all of them. In fact, Green Button comes from the, uh, from that relationship of the person that founded a company that provided the, the farms, the rendering farms to Weta. And then they realized, hey, I can do the same thing with Batch and I don't need to provide the rendering farm. So yeah, we're talking to all of them. The difference with them is that we're talking about a, 200 to 250,000 cores, yeah. and it's basic about pricing. Yeah. yeah, and they don't need any specialized. Surprisingly, talking to a few of them, they're not quite uh, leveraging the GPUs yet. Yeah. What they have done, because they really do buy commodity hardware, <coughs> is still CPU rendering. But uh, as long as we can provide them with enough, they'll do it, and Batch, I think, is perfect for that. So yeah, absolutely, we're these, talking these to guys, a whole bunch of them. These guys have really customized applications. Yeah. A lot of them they create themselves. Um, the, the guy the guy who was talking before about his researchers writing bad applications, these guys really know what they're doing about how they put these applications together to best utilize their hardware. And their workflows. That's another thing that we, we learn. Or, you know, you, we, we are just one step in a very complex workflow where there's you know the editing, there's uh, um, the, the artist, there's all these people that need to go into it. So we're trying to understand, do we provide something that facilitates not, not just the compute, but actually the workflow. So yeah, absolutely. It's one of those workloads uh, that right now, I would say it's one of the most demanding uh, big compute workloads mm. when it comes to just sheer volume of compute required. But apart from that scary one I've seen where they want a million cores, that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
So the question was if um, using hardware modeling applications would be tied to hardware dongle. Sorry, I'm repeating. Any kind reporting. of modeling application. Any kind of modeling where they actually got a hardware-based dongle model, yeah. physical, physical thing to actually get the licensing in. Um, There's a couple of ways of doing it, by the way. There so we, we talk to, uh, we'll, we'll work with you to talk to the ISV and say, hey, your customer wants this. We would love to have it in the platform. Not an easy conversation, but there are ways around it. You know, network map the USB devices and all that stuff. But the, so far, we've, I think we solved every single one of them. But it, it's, it's this kind of legacy way of thinking about yeah. licensing. I think the IUSBs are getting there. They're there's finally some getting there. There's some scenarios, like even if we can make it work, it might be sort of breaking the EU, EULA, so it's kind of not I'm that not good. I'm not suggesting that we're breaking the EULA. But yeah, but basically come to us, talk with us, and we're working with those ISV partners. We have teams of people just working with these different software vendors to try and make sure we get their licensing model changed. So you mentioned before, like traditional, really sort of strong traditional players like PBS and, and um, Sorry, Altair is PBS. Yeah, LSTC, um, and Ansys, and all these kind of guys are now running things in the marketplace. They're changing their licensing model to open it all up and to make it this way. It's, it's very, very hard. I mean, it's like a lot of our companies, we have to change. We're going from selling, you know, billions of dollars of Windows Server licensing, SQL licensing, to going, well, you know what? If you want to run SAP HANA, you want to run Oracle, you want to run whatever, just run it in Azure, and we're trying to, we're cannibalizing ourselves to get there, and they've got to get that same sort of mindset. It is happening, it's just, it's not, I mean, not, not just the mindset, the application is yeah. two days, right? And we so also if it's pinging a license server, if it's checking the USB drive, the USB uh, port, uh, someone needs to go into that code and change yeah. it, right? Yeah, and I mean, that's where we, we actually really need people like yourself, the customers, to come to us and go to them and talk to them because they, they need to know it's actually needs to, it has to happen because, yeah, otherwise, the reality is as everything changes, people like yourself might go, well, we really, really, in, you know, invested in this, however, now yeah. it's getting too hard. We're gonna I'll find worse. an alternative, right? We'll find an alternative. <laughs> no welcome. trouble. Thanks. More Any questions? other questions at all? We have three minutes. Otherwise, Felipe is going to sing. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody runs. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. Uh, yeah, I hope the party you. was great last night. And I uh, appreciate all the people who actually made it in before we started. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers.